carefully, 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 carefully open it. <laughs> All good, Tiffany? <laughs> All good. <laughs> um, I think a moment of five seconds of silence is a very natural reaction when you open this box and what you see is, I really think, one of the most important horological creations in Cartier's history. But actually, what is it? Why don't we start with you, Tiffany? What is it actually? So what actually it is, it's a magnetic clock. Uh, we've seen mystery clocks already, which is a horological marvel. But Cartier, they took this concept one step further. And not just content with using rock crystal to tell time, they decided to use water. So let's go step by step. This is the basin, the bowl. Yes. What is it made of? Where does it come from? Who made it? So it's uh, a bowl in uh, jade as well, nephrite. Made of how many pieces? It's only one piece. It's one piece. One cup. So nephrite. that means this chimera, dragon-esque creature. creature, is all in the same piece as the bowl. Indeed. Amazing work. So you have the bowl, you have the chimera on top, but Cartier, like the jade plaque, had used precious materials to elevate it even beyond what it originally was. What we're saying here is that, and I think you found also some amazing drawings in literature of this very clock, and I think there on the watercolor, it was annotated, we use an original. Yes, it's true. So when I placed this creation on my desk and said, research it, I said, where do I start? I've never seen anything like it before. We've seen turtles um, in a basin. Um, there's one in the Cartier collection. We sold one at Philips before, but we've never seen anything of this splendor. So I went through all the Cartier books. I dug up as much as I could. And in fact, in the Cartier collection, they say that of the very few uh, water clocks made, there is one example, the most lavish, the most prestigious, which was once seen at auction 30 years ago, but disappeared since, is a jade bowl with a chimera upon a base of adventurine, marble, and lapis lazuli. She found in this lovely book here, it was of course not exhibited at the no, back then. No, because they didn't know where it was. They didn't know where it was. Um, and here we see, I'd love to know who uh, used the pencil and wrote this. We use here an original, I think it even says, 18th century. 18th century, 18th exactly. century jade bull with a chimera. So what's quite amusing is that whether you call it a turtle clock or a red carp clock, <laughs> it's the chimera that is sort of leaning. Because he's trying to catch. Yes. But there's there's a very philosophical yeah. thing trying to catch the time and time keeps on running away from you. So now we go Further down, you mentioned it already, it stands on a black marble base mm -hmm. that is embellished with... Should I say it? <laughs> it's embellished with aventurine quartz and lapis lazuli, and enamel again. There we see this amazing combination of, I think, just absolutely amazing 1920s Art Deco with its geometric uh, designs. Could be part of a skyscraper in New York or uh, even, even in Hong Kong uh, in Central, there are these lovely Art Deco buildings with these very sculpted, uh, faceted uh, details. And then here we have a hole. Aha, so well, there we go again with uh, the magic of Monsieur Coué. Uh, there's, by the way, a book that I um, would recommend all our viewers which is over here, there's a lovely chapter dedicated to Mr. Kue, uh, working actually at his bench, isn't that him? Yes, with also the clock. With an archival exactly. picture that shows a creature that, if I may be very honest, isn't the turtle or a carp. And what we found out by speaking to a photography specialist, that back then, the exposure sometimes was 5, 10 or 15 uh, seconds long. And if it moved, that's why you get this rather funny 
blurriness. Okay. So it could have been this fish here, but just exactly. the exposure was too long to get, get a crisp uh, picture. But what is really incredible for me, and I think it was the most eye-opening thing I read, was in every piece of literature where this clock is mentioned, they all say that of all the water clocks, this is the most precious and the most lavish and the most impressive. So I think even Cartier itself recognizes the importance of this clock within it the It was scene. authored by the highest levels of scholars mm -hmm. in the Cartier organization. And they said this is the, I don't know what you call it, the, the, the sort of absolute pinnacle of floating water clocks in the Cartier history. Why don't we quickly take it out and show a few more details. If I may, I turn it this way. Again, not a lightweight. And now you may remove the box. Thank you. Look at this. The original label when it was auctioned in 1990. Isn't that amazing? Um, again, a moment for the purists, the key. The key with two keys, two different sizes, one for the movement and one for the time setting. Okay. Needless to say, now we do not yet, and I say yet, have it filled with water. We'll do that in a moment. But what is interesting is that it, besides this lovely oxidized plaque where you can See Cartier. spot the Cartier signature, this is where you go in and we've tested it and it does work. Mm -hmm. When you fill it and you have the fish in here, you can slowly, slowly turn it and believe it or not, I can hear it. you can hear the clicking, yeah. So how does it work? Shall we reveal that scoop as well? I think only I you I think can. we have to. <laughs> Should I? So we've got a very, very powerful clock movement in the base. And you will find out very quickly and think quite logically why powerful. Because in order to make this fish float up here, it needs a powerful magnet. Uh, it doesn't have an hour and a minute hand, obviously, but in order to make the fish follow the time, the fish here in its stomach has a piece of lead. Down here in the base, there is a magnet where, <laughs> when we tested it, we all said, let's move our watches away so they don't get magnetized. It's uh, so strong. It's nearly a horseshoe-sized magnet that turns once every 12 hours and the fish that has a piece of lead is following it through the water, through the jade bowl, through the entire construction. Uh, it floats on the surface of the water. It is so poetic, so philosophical, so magic. Um, I'm, I'm still as enchanted the first day when I uh, saw it. Let me quickly turn it around and maybe give you the possibility, uh, Tiffany and Benoit, to comment on the carving, the work on the back of the chimera, because you think it ends here with the shoulder, but look how far it goes. So you mentioned earlier on, this is carved from one piece of jade. Yes, indeed. And as you mentioned, it was an 18th century uh, bowl. So really carved and uh, again, as you mentioned, Aurel, like enhanced by Cartier and all the additional numerals, the coral accents, the gold uh, and the enamel. And I remember also regarding the mother of pearl, like the numbers are very thin and they are maintained with two small gold nails. And we discussed recently when we visited the uh, uh, 
watchmaker that actually 80% uh, of the model of Pearl is lost because it's so fragile. So to have like such thin numbers and with the two nails to maintain them, it's obviously a very, very fine work, uh, even in the, all the details that Cartier added to this 18th century ball. Uh, here we have all of the numerals intact. Mm -hmm. It's, how do we date it? Uh, late 20s? Late 20s, yes late 20s. We know that thanks to the beautiful drawings mm -hmm. and literature that uh, can be found in quite every uh, Cartier book of relevance. And it's been once at auction, I believe, in 1990. Exactly. And has since been in this remarkable collection. We've had some visitors, uh, colleagues and, and, and friends who saw it before today's video. I think one said literally this is the Indiana Jones moment I've been dreaming of for decades. I never thought I would see this again. It's only been known through pictures mm -hmm. to even the more senior statesmen in the Cartier community because 34 years is a career, literally a career in the field. But that, yeah, that's exactly what Cartier, even the book, that's what it says. It says it was found at auction 30 years ago and disappeared ever since. It's the missing link. Yeah, um, so, so who, who, might, who might be, where, where would you see this? Would you see this more with a jewelry collector, a timekeeper, timekeeping collector, an institution? In what part of the world do you see a particular taste drawn to this? I mean, obviously you see the Chinese influence that uh, Cartier had used back then. We've discussed extensively already about the jade screen, the mystery clock, um, the pendulette as well. Here, obviously you can see the Chinese element because of the chimera, of the jade, but there's also a universality to it, I think, of something of this quality that appeals to anyone, I would say, no? Yeah, of absolutely. Any kind of collector. And I think even back then, when Cartier was using, obviously, the Far East inspiration and some, like, Far East uh, elements, as we mentioned, they were not really for the Asian or Chinese market. They were for the European market. But with the fascination that the Far East had for Europe and the Western world, and we, it goes back to even the 18th century with the Compagnie des Indes and all these influences and the dialogue with the two worlds. And I think this is really a piece for a collector, as you mentioned. And I don't think it's really for a particular uh, country or like a state. It's really like someone who will appreciate the beauty of the element, obviously the watchmaking behind it and the, the Cartier object I, I that is I couldn't agree fun. more with you. I think it is of universal relevance. Uh, it is as good as Art Deco could be in any way. Absolutely. It's definitely going to fascinate anyone in the world of watchmaking and clockmaking. I think the jewelry world that bows to Cartier, the king of jewelers, mm -hmm. and will say this is as good as it gets. I think the design collectors, I mean, imagine you've got your New York penthouse or Los Angeles mansion decorated in Art Deco, it would be the centerpiece uh, in an entrance, in a dining room of, of, of utter beauty. And I think then there's what we would call today the collectors of the best of the best. That's what I wanted to say. Yeah. Well, I, <laughs> I just said this timepiece or this object, it appeals to the collector who just wants the best. Exactly. He doesn't need multiple or she doesn't need multiple, she just wants the best. And yeah. that, that's what it is. So basically, you, you, you go for the best Trophies. Um, uh, the, the Ferrari 250 GTO. At the same time, you have the very best impressionist or contemporary art. You've got premium real estate that is just beyond. And this is the, the natural fit. I agree with you. And I think every connoisseur and, and collector will have the same reaction when you open the box. I re remember when you opened this red case, I was absolutely mind blown. I was like, oh, this is the piece, it's here. <laughs> and it's, uh, I think this would be the same reaction for everyone who knows about Art Deco, Cartier, watchmaking and, and everything, as you say, someone who's looking for the best. You know, um, it's interesting you should uh, confess your emotions when I opened the box. 
I have not yet come across anyone and literally some of the most spoilt eyes and hearts have been wow, literally. I think that's the W-O-W exclamation mark exclamation mark has been the natural reaction to those who've had until now, until we break these news here, mm -hmm. uh, been, been uh, given the privilege to see it uh, up close. So you just mentioned that these were in fact made for the Western market. What do we know when you look at it about its past history and where was it sold? So we know it was made in Paris through the archives and also because all mystery clocks and same thing for this exceptional example, they were made at Cartier Paris. But as we mentioned also in another uh, previous, the mystery clock that we previously discussed, that we could see some elements on the box. And this one on the lid, you have again the Cartier stamp. And the first name under Cartier, the first location mentioned, is New York. So that was made in Paris, but sold for the American market. So I think it really shows this was done with a lot of uh, extraordinary good taste. And if I think back what New York, Manhattan, and I'm just sort of slightly a nostalgic dreamer, <laughs> wouldn't you see this in an incredible Park Avenue uh, apartment or even a Fifth Avenue uh, overlooking Central Park Art Deco decorated apartment. That was what you would bring home from Cartier New York. Uh, it's, it's just mind boggling. Mm -hmm. It's just mind boggling having survived 95 years in such immaculate condition with its traveling box. <laughs>